welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we are in the week of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And so we're delighted that you've welcomed us into your home. Perhaps you are doing some Thanksgiving preparation. We certainly would love to hear from you. Send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. And today, our guest is Father Shane Gallagher. He is a hospital chaplain in Letterkenny, Ireland. Mm. He is a contributor to the book called Advent Reflections. And this Advent Reflection Meditation is for a Holy Advent, and it's published by EWTN. So uh, today, it's the, you know, we're getting Before ready for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Lots going on, but we also need to be thinking about Advent, because when you go to Mass on Sunday, it's the first week in Advent. The Advent wreath is going to be out there, and the priest is going to bless the Advent wreath, and it's kind of mm. like, ready or not, here we go. And so EWTN has published this beautiful book for Advent Reflections uh, to accompany you on your Advent journey. There's daily readings, and it's broken down in every week, um, the beautiful four weeks to prepare you to fill you, to heal you, to make you a better human being as you prepare your heart, mind, and spirit to receive and believe that Jesus is born again for so us. So in the midst of all these great teachings, we're going to be hearing from Father Shane Gallagher and his particular teaching. It's in week three. It's entitled, Healing Our Senses and Our Souls. Mm. So he's a chaplain and he gets into the healing thing and speaks about our Lord's ministry. And maybe you really need to hear this. In Thanksgiving, there's so much to be grateful for, thankful for, joyful for, but we're filled with sorrow and we need healing in so many ways. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk and the deaf hear. These are the three of the signs of the Messiah foretold by the prophet Isaiah in his Sunday's first reading. So healing, that's the focus of Father Shane's teaching and I think it bodes well for all of us this Thanksgiving and as we begin the season of Advent. We'll be right back, plenty more to come. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and today our guest is Father Shane Gallagher. He is a hospital chaplain in Letterkenny, Ireland, and he is a contributor to the book Advent Reflections, Meditations for a Holy Advent. And this beautiful book is published at EWTNRC.com, and we're going to talk about it today because you might be needing an Advent companion. Just go to EWTNRC.com and get one of these, order it, and have it come right to your house. And um, this way you'll be ready as we, this Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent. Well, Father Shane, we are delighted to have you on at home with Jim and Joy all the way from Ireland. We would love for you to tell our family a little bit about yourself and your participation in this beautiful book. Well, Joy, uh, I was born into an average uh, family, Catholic practicing family uh, in Donegal here in Ireland. At the age of seven, I felt a very strong calling to the priesthood. Um, I remember at that stage writing a letter to the Pope at the time, St. Pope John Paul II. And I remember getting a letter back from him a number of months later, praying that I would fulfill my vocation. Wow. Um, yeah, at seven years of age, a letter from yes, the Vatican. That's amazing. And I remember, yeah, and I remember writing my letter uh, at the time. Uh, I remember on the envelope, just very simply, the Pope Rome. <laughs> that's just the that was the outside of the of yeah. the letter, you know. Yeah. Uh, so um, it was a yeah, it was I suppose the beginnings of a journey for me. And my teen years, then I, I turned away a little bit from my faith. Not not too much. I still went to mass. Uh, which was rare for some for most teenagers, mm -hmm. but I uh, I still kept that longing in my heart for for, for something, 
Um, every time I went to Mass and I saw the priest on the altar, I felt that I was called there too. But I didn't want to acknowledge it at the time. I was, mm. I was very dishonest, dishonest with myself. I kept covering it up. Um, I went to college and then I, I, I graduated and I, I became a secondary school teacher or a high school teacher, as you, as you call it over there. I taught for three years. And at the end of three years, I still felt the calling and I went to my local bishop. Uh, that was, I was 25 then. Um, and uh, at 31, I was ordained and I'm now, uh, I'll nearly be 45 uh, in January. So I'm 13, 13 years a priest. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, very happy. Uh, it's a challenging time. It's a challenging life, but it's a beautiful life. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, uh, it's a very fulfilling life, but it's also, it can be quite difficult yeah. at times, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't turn back from any of it. Uh, I, wouldn't, I have no regrets, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy to say, mm -hmm. I'm very happy and proud to be a priest uh, right. working for Christ. Amen. Well, thank, thank, thank you. you for your yes, Father. You are an inspiration. Tell us a little bit about your full-time ministry in a hospital there in Ireland what that's like, how large of a place it is, what you're seeing there, what, who you're ministering to. And perhaps maybe that's tied into the title mm -hmm. of your chapter, Healing Our Senses and Our Souls. But what's your ministry like there in the hospital? Well, it was providential that I got the section on healing. Uh, that was the area that I had to write on because uh, my work is very much centered on the sick and the broken. Mm -hmm. um, I work uh, on th for three day periods, 72 consecutive hours, mm -hmm. uh, myself and another priest. Um, I work three days, three nights. He works three days, three nights. Um, it's a demanding ministry, um, but nonetheless, a very beautiful ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, confession features very strongly in that ministry, not just anointing of the sick, but confession. Mm -hmm. Both go hand in hand in the, under the title of Sacraments of Healing. And I seem to get an awful lot of people who've been away from the sacrament mm. for years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I seem to get the big fish, as St. John Vianney put it one time, the big <laughs> fish. Mm -hmm. I, get, I seem to get a lot of big fish in the hospitals mm -hmm. that maybe priests and parishes missed out on. People away for 30 or 40 years from the beautiful sacrament of confession. Mm -hmm. And once, they, once they're reassured, once they're encouraged, once they're given, given a simple examination of conscience, then they're guided gently, and that begins the process of healing for them mm. on a spiritual level. Mm. But also, they're they're getting the physical healing in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also getting uh, they're getting two types of healing in the hospital. When when chaplaincy is at its fullest, when it is being used to its its when it's being used to its best, uh, it really uh, the, the the results and the outcomes are tremendous. Mm. And I've had so many many beautiful uh, um, encounters with mm. souls over the years in, in that hospital in yes. Letterkenny. Beautiful. Well, Thank Father, you. your, your title for your chapter again is Healing Our Senses and Our Souls. And you begin with Matthew eleven five: The blind receive their sight and the lame walk and the deaf hear. And of course, your chapter is in the context of all beautiful devotionals for the season of Advent. I'm not sure I thought about connecting Matthew 11:5 5 with the season of Advent. So why that particular verse and do unpack these ways of Jesus touching people who might be blind and deaf and, uh, and lame? Yeah, well, I think those three areas uh, are very much part of the whole spiritual blockage today. The, the fact that we we cannot walk with Christ at times because of sin mm. or because of some personal experience that maybe has separated us from the church or from Christ. A blindness because there are so many lights in the world, so many distractions and technology and the whole Hollywood scene, the whole television scene, we're blinded, like, a bit like standing in front of a car at night coming at us mm -hmm. with bright lights we can't see properly or our sight is affected. And uh, then being deaf also uh, because of uh, it is a very noisy uh, world that we live in. And, and I think uh, Pope Benedict spoke beautifully on that a few years ago, Pope Emeritus Benedict, when he, he talked about the need for silence, the need for 
uh, taking time out. Even our Lord went away to quiet places and he leads us by example. So, uh, yeah, so sight, the inability to walk with Christ. Yes. Uh, and also then the inability to hear the words of the gospel in these times. Mm. That is the crisis in the church and it is crisis in society. It means that we are not truly fulfilling our human destiny. We are not we are not living as God wanted us to live. John, John 10, chapter 10, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. Mm. We are not, I often think of the sunflower thriving, a beautiful sunflower. We, we as Christians, as Catholics, we are meant to be like the sunflower and we are meant to thrive. But I think today for a lot of Catholics and a lot of lapsed Catholics, we are merely surviving. Mm. Yeah. Well, Father, there's that beautiful illustration you're talking about, the sunflower. You know, there was, a, there was a book, it's called Heliotropium, where we turn towards the sun, but we as human beings, we need to turn to the sun, God, our Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, so that any way, we might not even be in sin, but we can become blind. Hmm. We can become deaf, like we, we've heard it. We're just not going to hear it a new way. Or like you said, we're not walking with God and we become lame in our journey. And so what are ways that you're seeing people, you're hearing unbelievable, I'm sure, in deathbed confessions where you're not only awakening their soul to the light and to the Son of God Almighty, but also their emotions and their feelings. I'm sure that there has to be a great awakening that happens in them, but also in us, even as we journey. I mean, it might not be sin that's blinding us. It's just that just by living and being, we get blinded, we get deaf, we get dumb in our way, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that... Uh Sin is the major block, obviously, but I think the distractions of life. And I think sometimes when a person ends up in a hospital bed, um, often the quietness, the four corners mm. of that room, the loneliness, sometimes the quietness is a good thing because for the first time in their life, they're forced to think mm. about where they're going, where they've been, what they're doing right now, mm. uh, what is going to happen, the possibility that they might not make it out of the hospital room. Uh, also, too, I think that the suffering too, I think suffering mm. uh, suffering bears great fruit. And even from the life of my, my hero, the reason why I became a priest, Pope John Paul, Pope St. John Paul II, I think he, he led by example. His, his, his treatment of suffering, his reaction to suffering uh, inspires many, particularly in hospital beds, to, to not just to, uh, to turn to God, but to respond richly mm. to God, very much so. Um, and it's in the suffering often that I've seen and I've witnessed many people turn back to God. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Father, yeah. in this area of uh, spiritual blindness, you know, you say when a person ignores common sense and resists a well-reasoned argument, pointing him clearly to the truth, then it should be fair to say that that person has some degree of spiritual blindness. So they just can't see no matter how clear it is or the way of truth, their spiritual blindness. And then you go on to speak about sophistry. Um, and you, you speak about the, the referendum there in Ireland regarding abortion. So just explain to us again how spiritual blindness works its way out and can be really fatal, if not for oneself, mm. but for others. Yeah, I think, you know, sophistry, uh, just to explain what sophistry was, yeah. uh, I, I, I may be, I'm open to, I'm not the best philosopher or I'm not, a, I'm not the best person to describe this, um, but I, I understand from sophistry was using language, using arguments to manipulate uh, ideas, to manipulate people's uh, ways of thinking. Um, in a way, I suppose uh, the Nazis in the 1930s could have been accused of using sophistry to get people's emotions up uh, in, a, in a very unchristian way. But um, I think, yeah, I think, for example, sophistry was used very much in the abortion referendum, whereby um, people, uh, you know, the, the general arguments against abortion were not used 
uh, people were brought in on individual cases and uh, for sentimentality was appealed to rather than logic, rather mm -hmm. than rationale. Yeah. We didn't turn to that. We turned to sentimentality. We turned to uh, the fact that uh, people were so hard done by because they couldn't get this or they couldn't get that, simply because the idea of a child blocking their plans in life yeah. or blocking this or blocking that. So sophistry, yeah, sophistry, uh, Socrates, the Greek philosopher, stood up against sophistry uh, in his time. And in fact, he, he stood against it in his trial. Um, and in fact, he was the one who was accused of corrupting the young people of, of Athens at the time, uh, whereas it was the sophists who were doing the exact the exact thing, what, uh, they, what, what they were accusing Socrates of, excuse me, was what they were doing themselves. Mm. Um, so the world, mm. uh, and we're, we're, look, we're looking here too at the master of deceit, the master of trickery, and it is Satan. And Satan is the one who, who uh, invents these things. He, he, he creates the, he maneuvers people into positions of sophistry so that uh, rationale and the common good uh, justice, morality is totally removed in favor of uh, sometimes sentimentality and mm -hmm. uh, false ideas that mm -hmm. lead people down a false path. And mm -hmm. I think very much in, in the area, for example, of the same sex union, uh, the same sex union referendum too in Ireland, sadly that we passed, I think too that uh, very much sophistry was used there, uh, whereby we were, we were told that people couldn't be happy unless we, we gave them the chance to do this, that, and the other, thus breaking the Ten Commandments yeah. and Catholic teaching. Well, it's yeah. true, because we, we do become deaf, dumb, and blind when we're being ruled by our feelings, right? And so yes. I feel like I want to be a man today, or I feel yeah. like I can do this. And, and so our feelings become not what's true, not what's beautiful, and not what's good. And, and then we become a society uh, that, that's just based on feelings. And why would I want to deny you anything if that's what you feel? And meanwhile, yeah. we're, we're letting people go to hell because that is not true, right? Absolutely. Well, it's the same idea as sentimentality. Feelings, yeah. Whatever you feel, whatever makes you happy. Uh, Pope Benedict talked about the, 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 the dangers of relativism. You know, everything is, you know, you, what I believe in is, is, is okay. What you believe in is okay. What they believe in is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, not everything is okay. Not everything is the truth. Uh, my truth is not your truth. But my truth still, in a, in a society that is liberal today, we, we are told to respect everybody's feelings, everybody. But in, in, in that type of environment, there is chaos. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, there is, there is, it's like a misty day. It's like a foggy day. Mm. You, yeah. you know, you, you don't, eventually the truth is obscured. Yeah. And we, and particularly in Ireland, we, Ireland was the bastion of Catholic faith for centuries. We, we, we were the ones who Christianized Europe. We were those, for example, if you go to Africa today, you'll meet many men and women with Irish names because of the beautiful witness of nuns and priests and Irish lay people who went out to catechize. Mm. Uh, but now we, we are, the, we are. I think Father Benedict Rochelle put it well a couple of years ago. He said that Ireland, uh, Ireland was the most anti-Catholic country that he visited mm. in his time as a priest. Mm. Uh, it was where he, he received the most opposition, sadly. Father, uh, so, so there is a spiritual blindness, yeah. yes. So, yes. Father, what are the remedies or what is the remedy for spiritual blindness? Because so much of Christianity, of Catholicism, is a way of seeing. If we can't see, how can we be saved? What are some of the remedies? Okay. Uh, the first remedy is confession, uh, turning back to God. Uh, as the Greeks put it, metanoia, conversion, uh, this turning. Yeah. A complete turnaround in one's mm -hmm. life, and we, we hear of we hear of many uh, beautiful conversion stories. Uh, for example, we hear of the story of Father Donald Calloway, people like that who have yeah. witnessed yes. so well. Um, you know, and and even the stories of the great saints Augustine, Saint Paul. Uh, so so, but but the the, the 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 first step in metanoia, I think, is to go into the confessional box, 
and to confess your sins to the best of your ability, allowing the priest to help you in a very gentle environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the sec I think then the second, the second uh, ingredient that we need um, in terms of uh, uh, conversion today uh, and a turning is prayer. Uh, prayer uh, then, pr prayer prior to confession, sorry, and prayer post confession. Mm -hmm. um, these, uh, and particularly the, the chief, I think one of the chief prayers for conversion is the Holy Rosary. Um, and again, there have been many, many beautiful conversions in the church through the Holy Rosary. I think of Blessed Bartolo Longo in Italy. He was a Satanist, and yet his life turned beautifully. I think Pope John Paul, Saint Pope John Paul, mentions him in the letter of the his encyclical on the Rosary. Uh, a number of years ago, he mentions Blessed Bartolo Longo, who had this beautiful turnaround because of the prayer of the Rosary. Um, regular, also too, I think, regular, in fact, daily, if you can get it, daily Eucharistic adoration also mm. uh, keeps the soul strong. And it also too, I think in the silence of the room that you, where Eucharistic adoration is taking place, Jesus is speaking to us in the depths of our yes. hearts and he's encouraging us to make the changes that are necessary. And I think just to finish, and I don't want to chat, I don't want to take over the conversation, but, uh, and I hope I don't appear rude, but I just want to bring in this point too, I was just looking at the Gospels for, for Advent, actually. Yes. And um, on the third the third Sunday of, of, of Advent, Gaudete Sunday, the, cheat, the, 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 the the line that jumped out at me from that Gospel, Luke's Gospel, what must we do? Uh, the people were coming to John the Baptist. What must we do? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same line yes. that we bring into adoration and to the rosary. What must I do? What yes. must we do? Well, Father Shane, thank you so much. We've run out of time, believe it or not. Again, your chapter is The Healing of Our Senses and Our Souls in this wonderful book, Advent Reflections, Meditation for Holy Advent. You can get it at ew10rc.com. Father Shane, thank you so much thank for giving you. us so much hope and turning our eyes and our ears and our pace mm. to Jesus Christ and to the great teaching of the church. God bless you, sir. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. God bless you, too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We'll be right back. There's plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, I love that conversation with Father Shane. And so beautiful, you know, you and I, we all need to take an interior journey. Mm -hmm. We all need to go before the Lord, hopefully in adoration and say, Lord, any place in my soul where I am blind, or I am deaf, and I, my heart is hardened and I'm not hearing you, and I'm crippled in my life. And you know what? Thanksgiving is coming tomorrow, and maybe there's family members coming in, and you need, you need to be at one with them. Take your personal interior journey and prepare your own heart that you would be all that God would want you to be, and you would have a beautiful encounter yes. with all of your loved ones and all those that you are with on this holiday. Mm. So this Thanksgiving coming up tomorrow, the season of Advent beginning on Sunday, let's remember the words, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk and the deaf hear. We need to acknowledge that. How many times I've been blind? How could I not have seen that thing? Mm. Why can't I hear? And Lord, so many people are falling away from the faith. May it not be me, Lord. Let me not be Judas, Lord. I I'm lame. How do I persevere till the end, Lord? I want to keep pace with what you want for me. And so for those that you're praying for, for you yourself, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, may you see, may you hear, and may you run. Mm. May you fly with the eagles in Jesus Christ. May it be the best Thanksgiving of your life, the best advent of your life. You're an important part of this EW10 family. You're never alone. You're always at home with Jim and with Joy. Bye now.